Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2011 Founders Day Convocation. Today is an important day in the life of Carson Newman College. It is important for all of us to know where and how the stream of history has flowed before us. For many reasons, it's important, but let me note but three. One, it is important to acknowledge that history does not begin with us. Rather, in our college's case, history has been underway for 160 years now. Two, history answers significant questions such as what happened, when, where, why, how, or uh, by whom, with and by whom. Thirdly, while the world is a classroom, history is our teacher, guiding us away from pitfalls and toward paths of well-being, uh, attitudes of gratitude, and dreams of our own. Carson Newman's history actually dates back into the 1840s, as most of you know, when Baptists of East Tennessee began discussing the need for a school where young people like yourselves, especially, however, at that time were they thinking of ministers and missionaries, uh, might be educated. In the spring of 1849, five devout men gathered under an old oak tree near the edge of a field and talked long about how this school might be located on the banks of Mossy Creek, where a planned railroad had designated a stop. Two and a half years after that meeting, the school opened its doors. Um, using actually an early version of this very church as, uh, to house its first class of students. Those proud early founders could not possibly have imagined that their fledging uh, educational enterprise would one day become the distinguished institution of higher education that the nation and much of the world now knows as Carson Newman College. Since our founding, countless others have kept alive those dreams shared at twilight under the old oak tree. Vision, prayer, and support make all things possible. I pray that our work together as Carson Newman family in these days will continually reinstill our founder's sense of vision and commitment. For you and I are shepherds of history, caretakers of Carson Newman College and her future. Our task is to work hard and well so that young scholars in this century and beyond will continue to have the opportunity to achieve excellence through education, Christian transformation, and aspirational service. What a joy we share in carrying the Carson Newman torch into the future to light the ways of time. Today, this morning, we gather to honor God and to honor Carson Newman College in this Founders Day convocation. Would you pray with me now, please? Loving Heavenly Father, for those who have gone before us who dared to dream, for those who currently work, study, and give, and live the dream, for those who will come after us to keep the dream alive, we give thanks. May your blessings forever rest upon our beloved school of providence and prayer and this part of your family called Carson Newman College. For we make our prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, it is my privilege to introduce to you two people who are my friends, who uh, also happen to be alumni of Carson Newman College. These folks have, in fact, been friends and supporters of this special place for a long time. Betty Gay Blank and Jack Owenby are living examples of how Carson Newman produces educated citizens and worldwide servant leaders. 
After each graduated, they went on to great success in life and business and have freely shared that success with us. Betty Gay Blank graduated from Carson Newman in 1949. As a student, Betty Gay loved to learn. You will see what I mean. Her passion for knowledge led her to a double major in mathematics and English with minors in chemistry, physics, and Spanish. Her wide range of interest was not limited to the classroom, however. Betty Gay was, in fact, a true Renaissance woman. She was active in the a cappella choir, the uh, literary society, the science club, the Spanish club, the German club. She was a cheerleader, and she also served as class secretary. Her love for life flourished during her Carson Newman years and beyond. In 1949, Betty Gay transitioned from a dedicated student to a devoted advocate for her alma mater. And her late husband, Henry Blank, a former trustee of this college, she found a life partner who joined her in supporting the college on the creek. Together, they willingly rolled up their sleeves and got involved. And today, Betty Gay faithfully continues her advocacy for her alma mater. Dr. Jack Owenby graduated in 1960. Jack was an accomplished athlete as a student, an outstanding student athlete. He was a four-year letterman in both basketball and baseball for the Eagles. And he played tennis pretty well too, I might add. He was a four-year starting pitcher for the Eagle baseball team and received many regional athletic accolades during uh, his time here. Just this year, in fact, he was inducted into the Eagle Hall of Fame. After graduation, Jack went on to earn his MA and his Doctor of Education degree and did additional postgraduate work as well. Jack has served his alma mater on the alumni board and on the President's Roundtable. He has been a teacher, a coach, um, a school and hospital facility planner, and is co-founder of Healthcare Facilities uh, LLC. Betty Gay and Jack are our 2011 representatives of Founders Day. They embody the kind of graduates our founders had in mind when they began this great institution. We will hear first Mrs. Blank, and then in a few moments, Dr. Owenby. Well, good morning. Buenos dias. Guten tag. Yeah, bonjour. Bonjour. Anybody speak any of those? Yeah, there's a few more. Come on up with them. Okay, I just, that's all I have any understanding of. But I love them. I uh, really in all that learning I've enjoyed doing. Foreign languages have become a lot of fun. And uh, I'll sort of tell you how it happened. Dr. O'Brien probably knows more of this Founders Day thing than I do. It wasn't until the 150, no, the 100 year, our sesquicentennial, the college put on a pageant called On Eagle's Wings. And it gave us the best presentation of how the college was founded. And at that time, I, it was okay with me that we couldn't dance on the campus because I realized how these people who had founded the college, that was one of their things they didn't want. And so we didn't do it, and we don't, still don't, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, okie dokie. <laughs> to uh, quote my mother, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. How many of you woke up this morning and said, yay, I get to go to chapel and hear some old woman talk? <laughs> yeah, I, I can just see it now. The first time, first time I ever spoke to a chapel group was when I had 
three little girls by then. One of them was about three months old. It's February. It had rained 21 days in February, and we didn't have a clothes dryer. I'm thinking diapers. We didn't have the disposable ones. So with my clothes hanging all over the house, I came in. I don't even remember what I was supposed to talk about. I'm not sure right now either. But anyway, we will continue. I have wanted recently not over only to thank the people who started this college. They surely had no idea what would happen. But we've got to appreciate them. Can you imagine riding on horseback in the 1800s through East Tennessee, mountains, forests, whatever, and trying to raise money for a college? But they did it. And I think we need to think of that occasionally and just um, appreciate them. I also want to say thanks to my parents, and I hope that you can think of yours. They gave me all the good genes I could possibly need. They taught us honesty, responsibility, and hard work, and I hope you're still doing those things because that's how you'll get, get by, okay? For several... Uh, months now, I have been kicking and screaming, trying to fight off old age, and it doesn't work. <laughs> but uh, I thought of that uh, poem, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should have been a rave at close of day, rage, rage against the dying of the light. And I have been raging, although I'm not dying, but I tell you, every morning, after you pass for it, if you need any advice, okay? I, I live in town, so just give me a call. We'll work on that. Okay. I had an advantage over most people because after I graduated, I married a local guy, and we raised our family here. We've been in on the mornings and the evenings and all the in-betweens with Carson Newman. It's, it's like it's really our child in a way. And one thing I have liked about Carson Newman and uh, found when I first came here, I didn't want to come to Carson Newman. I wanted to go to Duke. What in the world I would have done there, I don't know. But my 10th grade English teacher had gone to Duke, and she inspired me. I even enjoyed writing term papers for her. So Mother and I sort of made an agreement. I'd come to Carson Newman for two years, and then I could transfer. Okay. Well, guess what happened? I got up here on the train, the Southern Railway, where the conductor announced we had arrived at Mossy Creek. I guess they're the last persons who ever called it that. Came in, got assigned to my room, which was really small, and worse than that, it was dirty. We didn't live in luxury at my house, but it was clean. What had happened, the Navy V-12 unit had been here a few months, and things had been sort of let go during that time. So they, they promised us they were going to paint the room soon, and we began our journey. I lived in that little bitty room for four years. It was, the building's not here now, I just found in my research, by the way, <laughs> this. this is the college history as, you know, people know it. And then this is my annual from my senior year, and that's how I knew it. So if you need anything that they will help you with, let me know. <clears throat> what uh, the treasurer wouldn't, I don't know why he was the one to say so, but he didn't want us to paint our room. We were going to buy the paint and fix it up. His reason was that no, the next person might not be as good painters as we were. So let's not do that. 
and they were going to paint anyway, and they did. So eventually, as I said, for four years, I lived right there. They took that down and put the library there. But when we were here, my room was on this corner on the front, and it was right where the guys came through for lunch and supper, and we could stay in our room and see who was getting into lunch. By the way, <laughs> they, when, and this was in 1945. I forgot to say that was the day after Japan surrendered. So I'll never forget when I came to college. That, that was the end of World War II for us. So um, we had a most unusual class. We started out very small because a lot of the guys were still in the service. But by the January, here they started coming back in and we had a normal kind of college. But at first, I gotta tell you about the cafeteria. It was a dining hall. It was in Sarah Swan, and that left parlor. You come in and we had family style meals. There was a host and a hostess at each end of the table. There were pitchers of milk and water. And I don't remember how everything was served. But that finally gave way to a cafeteria where we came through in a line. Well, that was pretty good for a while, but the milk was already poured in our glasses. And sometimes by the time we got there, the cream had already risen to the top. Now, you all probably don't know about that, do you? You've always had homogenized milk. Too bad. <laughs> any rate, so we, we sort of did a little protest about that. And finally, we got uh, milk in cartons so we could at least shake it up. You all really don't know about milk? <laughs> See, that's what I can't realize. I asked somebody the other day if they remembered something, how we recycled things during the war. We cut out both ends of the tin can and stomped them flat and recycled. And I said, you remember? She said, no, I wasn't here then. So I tell you what, I think I'm going to finally write a book. There's just too much that you're not getting right now. I got to tell you one thing, too, about my dorm mother. <clears throat> she, uh, I guess she was about six feet tall and was almost this skinny, but of course not quite. <clears throat> she walked down the walk shielding herself from the sun. I'm not really making fun. The only thing that bothered me was I always like to whistle. <clears throat> I can't now. My mouth's too dry. But at any rate, I'd be coming in the door, whistling up a storm, and she wanted me to stop. That wasn't ladylike. Well, I couldn't stop. And now my daughter whistles, and when she does, I know she's happy. So that's okay. In 45, our president was Dr. Warren. Dr. Warren was big as a bear. His handshake was really hearty. But the college was small enough then he had time to even come to my house to recruit a new student. So chalk one up for him. Okay. These things I thought of uh, before, I don't want to forget to tell you. One thing I want you to learn is to think for yourself. If, if you don't learn that and along with this other education, you're going to be hurting. Look at what all they shoot you at TV. Every, every medicine to take care of everything anybody ever heard of, but if you watch, nearly all of them have a warning. Could cause this, could cause that, maybe even this. You know? So, so read the labels and listen. They're trying to sell something. They're not trying to help you feel good. Okay? Think. Uh, what else? 
I called the TV station the other day. I guess I'm an activist in a way. But being an English major and teaching English, every time I come across a misspelled word anywhere, it stops me in my tracks. I just can't handle it. I've got to figure it out. So the other morning on TV, here was this first big ad. For some, and they had done this in the studios. It was little signs they had made. There was something about Rockefeller Plaza. R O C K. What's next? Rockefeller. It's not an A, is it? No, but it was that morning. Rockefeller. Then I looked, they were advertising a new restaurant. Well, that was well and good. We can all use nice new restaurants, but restaurant. R E S T. U R A N T. Well, that bothered me. And I didn't think they should be showing that. Children are watching these things, and they shouldn't be. <laughs> they don't need to be exposed to any more misspelling. So, see, if I had a job, I guess I wouldn't get so tied up in other things. Oh, I got up here and just found that dirty room. But they had things planned for us, and we had a get acquainted party out on the lawn, and it was, I don't, do you still have those? Well, we did. And when she, somebody said, your mother's on the phone, so I went in, and she told me I didn't have to stay. If this place was too dirty, I could come right home. I didn't have to wait two years to transfer. But I was already hooked. Now, I wasn't hooked on the dirty room. You realize what I was hooked on? It was this atmosphere. It was the fun we were having, and she was also one who didn't believe in studying all your life. You know, she said, you gotta do some other things too, so that's where those things came. Any rate, my parents got their money's worth when they sent me up here because I took part in everything. You know, during the war, we couldn't get the gas and the tires to run up and down the highways for ball games and cheerleader practice. So I didn't get to do all those things in high school. But man, Carson Newman had them. And I took care of them. Okay. I had a little rude awakening one weekend. I'd gotten a little bit homesick. I took the weekend off. It must have been a long one because uh, I realized afterwards the truth of what I'd been hearing, that if you drop a pencil in class, you'll be a week behind when you get it back on your desk. And so I didn't get quite a week behind, but I was behind far enough that it was a question now, should I drop this college math, I mean college algebra is what it was, or should I dig in and catch up with everyone? Have you had that choice to make yet? And that's all right. But I just want to tell you, somehow I had the good sense to dig in, teach myself what I'd missed, and get back on track. And I guess that was the point at which I added Math is another major. And that was sort of a life lesson number one. Don't give up on a worthwhile goal. Well, sophomore junior went fine. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take everything, but I'd really like to. What I'd like to do is let's sit down and tell you all these wonderful things that happened. But it was only at this college. It was when I was ending my junior year that we got news that my grandmother had cancer. Well, I wanted to do something to help. So at that point, I decided, well, I can't become a doctor. There's not enough time left in my education days. So I'll be a lab technician. Now, I didn't ask anybody's advice. Those were just the things I thought I could get into that might help. Well, 
That summer, I enrolled at the University of Chattanooga and took chemistry. I thought chemistry was de definitely needed for these things. Now, see when I started that? After my junior year. But I just loved what we did. And I, at the university, I fell in love. Well, no, I had a crush on my lab instructor. And not only that, he took me sailing every afternoon after class, and I learned how to do that. So <laughs> that was wonderful. OK. <laughs> the summer ended, and it was back to Carson Newman. And uh, I added a few more chemistry classes. I really enjoyed those, too. It's really, it's really fun to keep adding a drop of something to to a mixture and see what happens to it after so many drops have gone in. It's, it's really fascinating, and I recommend it. At any rate, uh, finally I got Dr. Bonner let me in. Dr. Bonner was an amazing person, and he was pretty much world-renowned for his work in chemistry. So he had this thing going where he had the students to do some research. We call it research. We made chemicals, compounds, to send to the Sloan Kettering Institute who worked on cancer problems. So we'd mix up these things the way he told us to, send them off, and they'd try it. They'd try it on the mice, on the cancer cells. And it kills the cancer cells in the mice. Wonderful. but. It also killed the mice. So we had to go back to square one. Actually, they are now using, they're trying some of those same compounds on uh, different diseases that we have today. One is the tuberculosis bit that's resistant to other treatment. So, and you know what? They still have our our reports, the record of what all we made, still in the chemistry lab. And I was so excited one day I got to show my book to my grandson. And so he knew some of the things we did. Um, we didn't have TV or cell phones or much of anything else, but we were happy. What we did have was mandatory chapel with assigned seats five times a week and classes five and a half days a week. With no cars, we couldn't go anywhere on the weekend anyway, so what the literary societies, do you still have literary societies? The Calliopians and the Hypatians? The Columbians and the Philomathians? Well, you know what? That was our chance to learn some culture. We dressed up on Fridays. All went to our societies and we took care of our own programs. And I, I decided, you know, that's something about growing old. You, you can look back and think about how some things were good. The literary societies were our entertainment on Friday nights. And also, we had four officers president, vice president, secretary, and Critic. See, we made up our own programs, and the critic was right there to help us if we'd hit the spot or not. So I found that all of the clubs gave us an opportunity to use some of the things we'd probably need later on. Okay, there was a club for everything, and I was in almost every one of them. I didn't want to miss out on anything. So music was my next, it wasn't a major or anything, but I spent a lot of time with it. I was able to take organ lessons, got to where they'd let me play the organ for chapel. And I also played for the acapella choir. What did I say, acapella? <laughs> Heavens help us, I'm sorry. Anyway, when we'd go on tour, uh, we'd had the whole church service. And uh, so I played the organ for that church service with my group. Then we also had a very active BSU. You don't have BSU anymore, do you? What does it mean? Do you even know? 
Really? Baptist Student Union? Okay, that provided us. We had morning watch, which was somewhat of a prayer meeting. We had a noonday prayer meeting, and then sometimes we'd have vespers at night out here on the front. So that kept us busy. We had a lot of missionaries going to be missionaries and a lot of ministerial students in those days. I don't know what you have. Now, I need to get down the books now and see how you're doing. And I want to know one thing. Are all of you, oh, and we had no smoking. No one even thought of smoking. So I, if I ever stop somebody and question you about that, you'll know why. I do want to tell you, I want you to think for yourselves. And when you think some action is needed, do it. And stay, surround yourselves with positive people. A negative little conversation can ruin your day. So that, think positive, and think for yourself, excuse me, and what was that last thing? Oh yeah, this poem by Robert Browning, the best is yet to be, the last of life for which the first was made. Our times are in his hands, he saith, the whole I planned, Youth shows but half. Trust God, see all, nor be afraid. So I've tried to get her away from that kicking and screaming. And as I was working on this, I realized that's the one really nice advantage about growing old. You have lots of good memories. And I hope you will too. What I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you what I call memory or the memorial of remembrance. I'll take you back to 1956 when I came to Carson Newman as a, as a freshman. I came from a little place called Pigeon Forge. And I came over, had three goals in mind. I wanted to play basketball, baseball, and get a good education. And I could play basketball fairly well. I could play baseball fairly well. But my game was really spiritual dodgeball. I don't know where any of all ever uh, played spiritual dodgeball. But spiritual dodgeball is when you pretend to be something that you're not. That you're a fake and a phony. And when I was 10 years old, I joined a church in, in Gatlinburg and was baptized. But there was no regeneration. There was no relationship to Jesus Christ. And I began an eight-year journey of spiritual dodgeball, uh, trying to dodge and try to weave and don't get into a situation that, that you might have to answer a, que a spiritual question. And so I was, uh, I, I, I'd gotten really good at it. And so I knew uh, coming to Carson Newman, Carson Newman was a Christian college and, and uh, I knew I was going to be rubbing shoulders with ministerial students and full-time Christian workers, but, but because I had eight years of experience, I thought I could deal with it. So my first year, I came uh, as, as a freshman uh, in basketball. I was uh, the backup center for Arnold Mellinger, and Arnold Mellinger was probably arguably the greatest center that Carson Newman had in his first hundred years of, of history. And so I, I, my goal, my job was to guard Arnold in practice. And Arnold was, he was captain, he was a leading scorer, he was a, he was a leading rebounder, and Arnold took no, no prisoners. So every day he beat me up in practice. And so I usually got in when we were way ahead or way behind or when they were afraid that somebody was going to get hurt, so they would put me in to be the punching bag so that, uh, so that the first team wouldn't get hurt. So in baseball, I had a, uh, a record of four and two, four wins and two losses, and the only problem was that I would have been five and one except over in Maryville, we were leading, we, we were leading them three to two in the bottom of the ninth with two outs. And I walked this guy, and a guy got a hit, and then we had this play where we were going to try to pick him off, but I reached up and caught the ball and, 
and messed it up. And so the next guy up was, was a friend of mine, knocked it over the shortstop's head, and they beat us four to three. Coach Holt wouldn't talk to me for about three or four weeks because, he, because that was the way he was. So after, after that year, but, but, but my spiritual dodgeball was excellent. I was 10 and 0 in spiritual dodgeball at the end of my freshman year. I'd stayed away from the BSU. I'd stayed away from the ministerial students. I'd stayed away from the full-time missionaries that were coming back. So I felt like that I had really had a good year. So Coach Holt, at the end of that year, he said, uh, Jack, I want you to go to work for Magnavox. I think it was called Jefferson City Cabinet Company, but it's out on the road to, to Morristown. And, and so he got me a, a job working at night, cleaning the fans that, where they had the spray booths. So I'd go out at 4 o'clock, and we'd, another guy and I would clean them until 12 o'clock. And then on the weekend, I would pitch for them in the Industrial League, uh, the East Tennessee Industrial League. Well, that left the days open, so in order to uh, uh, get ahead a little bit, I began uh, taking six hours in summer school. And, of course, you know summer school is not as many students. It's laid back. The professors are more uh, friendly, and so I was, I was taking that. So one day, a little girl, uh, you know, my antenna, my spiritual antenna was down. It was uh, uh, because it was summer school. and like one, uh, one day, a little girl from, from Lenore City, and I didn't know her. Her name was Martha Anthony, and she was Miss Lenore City, and she'd been one of the finalists in the Miss Tennessee contest. And so she asked me to go with her out to the lake for a picnic that was being sponsored by the BSU. Well, the picnic and the lake caught my attention. That BSU went right over my head because I, I, I wanted to stay away from the BSUers because they, they asked questions. They asked questions that, that, that counteracted my spiritual dodgeball intent. So I said, okay, I will go. And so as I sat there, right beside me was a guy named Sonny Hammer. Sonny was an older student, one of those real old students, about 25 or 26. And uh, you know how they, they are. Uh, and he had quit his job up in D.C. and he had come back to go into the ministry. So after class, I said, Sonny, can I talk to you? And so Sonny and I walked out. The, the tree is still there. It's the big oak tree. It's right now at the corner. I went by to see it this morning before we came by. Uh, and it's the one just behind the, uh, the library. So Sonny and I went out and sat down on a bench that sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not there because I've been checking it for the last 50 years. Uh, it, that, and I said, Sonny, I said, I need to know how to become a Christian. So he took his Bible and he shared with me the gospel, how that Jesus sent his son to die. And that he died on the cross for all sins. And that through faith, you can appropriate that and invite him into your, into your heart. And he quoted Revelation 3.23, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man or woman would open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. And he asked me, he said, Jack, do you want to do that? And I said, I sure do. I sure do. So he led me the Lord's uh, Sinner's Prayer, and it was sort of like, if you read Pilgrim's Progress, you remember when Pilgrim was going to the celestial city, he was trying to find a celestial city, what was he carrying? He was carrying a heavy load and a heavy burden, and, and at the cross where he asked for forgiveness, what happened to it? It rolled off. And it's what happened to me, that as I appropriated that, that burden that I'd been carrying around for eight years was, fell off. And, and, and I, as I walked down, we were living in this little red house. If you walk down by, uh, by Butler, all the way down toward the old, the, old, uh, the old town, there's a little red house. I think it's a salon now, hair salon. But I went by there this morning just to check it out. And it's where we were staying. I don't think my feet hit the floor, hit the ground on the way back down there. So, I, I mean, and a couple of days later, I saw Sonny. It was coming around Baker, going to the, to the cafeteria. And he, he hailed me. He said, Jack, he said, wait a minute. He said, I have something for you. 
So he said, I've got this Bible for you. And this is the Bible that he gave me. And in it, I opened it up, and in it was these, this passage. He said, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. And that has become my life verse. Signed, Sonny Hammer. Sonny and Martha never came back after summer school. I never saw them again. Later on, 40 years later, I told this to some of my Sunday school classes or Bible classes, and they said, you know, these are computer people. They said, we're going to find them. So we found out that Martha had, mar had married a, a music minister, and she'd lived her life uh, as a music minister's wife and had passed away, but we never found Sonny Hammer. We never found him. So I'm going to have to wait till we get into heaven that I'm going to be able to thank both of them adequately for the role that they played in my salvation. Even though, and in conclusion, even though I helped dig the footings for the uh, Holt Field House, even though I shot the first basket in the Holt Field House, even though I played a lot of good games in the Holt Field House, and as Dr. O'Brien said, even though there's a plaque over there with my likeness on it in the Hall of Fame, that's not my memorial of, of remembrance. My memorial of remembrance is that oak tree right out there. That's where I go when I come back. Because that's when the, my life has changed for time and eternity from that one session out there. And what I would hope for you is before you leave Carson Newman, that you find or you discover a memorial, a memory, a memory that you can look back on in the years ahead and you say, that's the reason, that's the memorial where I, where it indicates how much I love Carson Newman. And hopefully each one of you can find that. Thank you. Carson, you're my name.